Welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm glad, it, I'm glad we did this uh, this evening instead of at noon, eh? <laughs> it's always important that everybody can hear me. Can, can you hear in the back okay? Great. So, okay or need to go up? Great, great. So we're going to talk about gut health and how important that is, how central it is to our good health for every part of our body. We're going to start tonight and we're going to talk a little bit about integrative medicine. I'll bet you some, some of you have heard that term. Uh, Betty, when she introduced me, um, used that term. And by the way, I want to just, uh, thanks for the introduction, Betty, but also for putting these on. This is a, one of actually several lectures we've done this year on kind of optimizing health from a natural perspective in the community uh, and the corporate health department of Capital Region has really helped made this happen. So I thank them for that. So we're going to talk about integrative medicine, really what it is and how it's different than standard conventional medicine. We're going to look at the foundations of, of gastrointestinal health. We're going to look at food sensitivities and gut inflammation and, and how those two are linked, very importantly, and actually inflammation in the body as well. We're going to look at gluten sensitivity and the worst kind is celiac. And I'll bet you there's some people in this room that, that do indeed have celiac or at least gluten sensitivity. There's a high chance of that. And then we're going to look at specific conditions and, and symptoms like reflux and irritable bowel syndrome and bloating and gas and constipation. And I hope to give you um, some ideas on how you can really reduce those symptoms and maybe completely resolve them. How's that? Yes. <laughs> and last, we're going to talk at the end about gut bacteria. There is an explosion of information about how these little critters that live in our gut, these bacteria, are not our enemy, they're our friend. They help us make vitamins, they help turn inflammation down in our body, they help lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, they do an enormous amount of things. They help us lose weight if we're having the right bacteria, they decrease the risk of diabetes. Really important uh, and amazing information that's coming out every week on that. So the, the mission of the Integrative Medicine Clinic, wellness, and prevention. That's keeping you well. That's what we're about at the Integrative Medicine Clinic. And it's also about educating patients that belong to the clinic. And I see out there many patients that have seen us in the clinic, and I welcome you here. And all of those that haven't been to the clinic or seen these lectures before, I also welcome you. So it's about empowering patients with education, both the clinic patients, but also people in the community. And that's what these community education lectures are about. And it's treating the cause of disease and not just the symptoms. We're going to talk a lot more about that. And that one thing, focusing on treating the cause of illness rather than just the symptoms of illness, is really what separates integrative medicine from conventional medicine. In integrative medicine, we always move towards the safest and the least aggressive approach to health and to interventions when we need that, the safest and the least aggressive forms of treatment. So in conventional medicine, if a patient comes in, and, we, and, and many of us go to see our doctors for these sorts of conditions, depression maybe, or anxiety, or high blood pressure, or heart disease, diabetes, or chronic fatigue, we go there for that. And, and doctors, because we're there to help people, we're going to help treat those symptoms. But an integrative medicine clinic is a little deeper, so to speak. And we're going to look for the root cause of the problem. And it turns out things like poor digestion, or, or lack of exercise, or lack of sleep, or toxins in our body, many, many other things make this individual sick and can cause and can manifest in a lot of different ways, like the anxiety, or the high blood pressure, or the diabetes. So we look for the root cause of illness. And I'm, I want to say that I'm not here to discount the amazing benefits of conventional medicine, the, the high-tech surgical procedures, the wonderful medications, the anti-cancer therapies, the medications for depression and uh, for high blood pressure and for cardiovascular disease. This is, this is terrific medicine in the 21st century. And if you were to go see a cardiologist and you had a circulatory problem, 
that would be the doctor you would see. And if you had a GI problem, you would go see a gastroenterologist, of course. And if you had a nerve problem, you'd see a neurologist. And all the way down, if you had a plumbing problem, you'd go see a urologist, right? Well, that human physiology is more connected than that. More connected than that. There's a, there's a complex web that is the physiology of, of human beings that all of these systems are connected. They're, they're not in a silo. I mean, your heart is just not sitting there for the cardiologist to take care of. It's the whole human being. Now, the cardiologists know that. But again, in integrative medicine, we try to focus on the big, the whole system. And one of the parts that allows us to provide the best health is right at the center of the human body and of human physiology is the gut. And that's why we're here tonight to talk about the gastrointestinal tract and how, how it can help make us better and keep us well or how it can make us sick. So if the gut's not working well, if it's inflamed, if it's not absorbing the important nutrients, you're much more likely to get a neurological disease. For example, you may not absorb your B12. You're more likely to get arthritis in your joints if your gut is inflamed. You're more likely to get diabetes. And interestingly, if your GI tract is inflamed, you're more likely to get heart disease. So all of these conditions are linked to an unhealthy, inefficiently functioning gastrointestinal tract. So how do we fail? How do we fail our bodies? We fail by eating the wrong foods, hydrogenated foods, foods with too much sugar, not eating enough of the colorful foods. And I'll show you what I think is the optimal diet in a few minutes. Not eating, eating enough of the naturally anti-inflammatory foods and eating too much junk. And, we, and many of us do that. And, and, and that's a big key. So we eat the wrong foods. And then we may eat too much of those foods, right? And then I'll bet you, if, particularly if you had a lecture to give tonight, that you may eat those foods too fast when it was 6 o'clock for dinner. No. Um, so, we, so we eat our foods too fast, right? And digestion is really important. And we're exposed to too many antibiotics. And we're exposed to the antibiotics because we might have infections in the winter, mostly which are viral, by the way, and we really don't need antibiotics for. And in our food, 70% of the antibiotics that are used in this country are in our animal feed. Now, let me tell you why that is. Let me tell you why that is. So if they feed animals a small amount of antibiotics while they're growing, it causes gut inflammation. And the gut inflammation makes their fat cells absorb more fatty tissue. Same thing happens in human beings, folks. They knew this from the 1940s, and they've been giving the animals the antibiotics. And we get exposed to those antibiotics because we eat those animals, right? And we can, we can go to our local farmers and get meats, poultry, and eggs that don't have antibiotics. And I'd encourage that. And when we found out why that happens, now we know that that's one of the toxins and poisons we should try to stay away from. We may not be able to avoid all of it, but the more we avoid, the better. So the pillars of GI health is to digest your food, and that means to relax <coughs> before you eat, to chew your food. It's not just two, you know, two bites and a gulp and down it goes, right? That you need to really break down your food. And we need the right enzymes in our stomach and acid. We also need the right gut integrity, and that talks about the lining of the small intestinal tract. That's really important. I'm going to talk to you more about that. And one of the things that makes that more ineffective and kind of that break, breaks down that barrier are foods that we're allergic to, things like wheat possibly or dairy. The, another thing that's really common are, are, are medications that, that many of us take now and then. Some of us take it every day, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Those are medications like Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen, Naproxen, Celecoxib, there's lots of those, you know, for arthritis pain. Those break down the barrier, the gut, the gut lining, and we don't absorb as well. Taking care, of our, uh, taking care of our gut buddies, those are the bacteria in our gut. So avoiding antibiotics whenever possible. You can't always avoid them, but most of the time. And we need to eliminate. So, you know, the GI tract brings in this nutrition, but we got to get out the toxins. And it means that we need to eliminate, we need to move our bowels a couple of times a day or at least once a day. 
Not every two or three or four or five days. That's not enough to detox our bodies. Now, um, before I go on to the next slide, I really like it. Um, first of all, that you're all here and, and that you're interested in learning about this to take responsibility on your own health and to really improve the health of yourselves and your community. And you'll teach the people around you from the things you've learned tonight. I see that happen all the time, right? I want you to ask questions tonight and not feel like you, you just have to sit there if there's something you don't understand, particularly if you think that question is kind of relevant to the whole crowd. So I wouldn't want to answer a specific question about your medical history, but you know, if you think there's, if there's something that you don't quite get, so just let me know, because I want this interactive. I want you really, um, really involved in it, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so real, real briefly, and we're going to talk about magnesium more because it's really important. Magnesium is a really important mineral, and it's a mineral that, that, that stimulates the bowel wall muscle. The GI tract is really a muscular tube, and it peristalsis, it moves things through, and magnesium makes that muscle work better. The other thing that magnesium does is it draws water into the GI tract. And so that makes stools moister. It is very, very safe unless you have severe renal disease. So we can all be taking it if we need it. Don't take it if you don't. And it can be very, very effective. I particularly like magnesium citrate, which is inexpensive and very effective. So let's take a run through the GI tract. Oh, did I use the word run and GI tract together? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so. It starts, folks, it starts when we first anticipate food, the digestion, and when we smell food and see food. Because what happens is that the brain sees that and it uses this nerve called the vagus nerve. Vagus means wandering nerve, vagabond nerve, that goes through the chest to the belly, goes to all of the organs in the gastrointestinal tract, turns on the digestive process, right? So it's, it's kind of anticipating your food and letting that happen and enjoying it and giving yourself a little time to relax all of this all of this miracle can start. And the miracle is that we can take this food and we can transform that into muscles that we do work with, um, rods and cones that we see things with, cells that we have on our skin, and, and energy that we have to get all the work done that we do all day long. That's a, mir a miracle that happens in this GI tract. And so the food is then into the mouth and we chew it and we begin to break it down so we need more than a couple bites. And then in the mouth, there's saliva. And saliva is really interesting in that it has some enzymes itself. It has an enzyme called amylase that starts to break things down. So when you eat a bagel, for example, and you can taste a little bit of sweetness from that bread, the, the, the wheat in there, it's because the amylase enzyme is breaking down right away the starch into sugar, and then you can taste the sugar from the starch in your mouth. How's that? So the process starts there. And then it goes to your, G it goes to your stomach. And in your stomach, there's acid in there, and you've heard of this acid. Hydrochloric acid, one of the most powerful acids, on, a, acids in the whole, on the whole planet, right? It's in our stomach, and that breaks down food, and the stomach churns a bit, and starts to really break things down. And then it moves from there to the small intestine. And in the small intestine, the, the liver and the, and the gallbladder secrete bile that helps us absorb and break down fat. The pancreas releases enzymes like proteases and amylases and lipases to help us break down fat and protein, carbohydrates. And all of these things happen. It continues to churn and it moves through that 18 feet of that small intestine. That's where the magic really happens, that transformation of food into life-giving energy and in the raw material that we rebuild our body with and that 18 amazing feet of intestines. And after that, there's another five feet of large intestine. And we just thought large intestine was a storehouse for, for stool before we would go to the bathroom. Well, it turns out that the large intestine is incredibly important too, because that's where our good bacteria live. And those good bacteria, again, what they do is they help us prevent cancer in our colon. They decrease our risk of cardiovascular disease. They lower inflammation. They decrease our risk of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome and thyroiditis. So that's the amazing GI tract from top to bottom. This is 
some information about that amazing small intestine, that 18 foot long that transforms and absorbs all of the important nutrients. On the left there, you can see there's lots of little folds in there. So that increases the surface area so it can do its work. Then the next, over just one to the right, on each one of those folds are these little finger-like projections called the villi, villi. And each one of those increase the surface area of the small intestine. And then on top of that, on each one of those villi are microvilli, and those microvilli increase it more. And it turns out that the outer world, which is inside us now, now recognize that the food we eat never really gets into our system. It's in the GI tract, and, and we're protected by one single layer from all of those bacteria and things we don't want in there. One single layer, that's the gastrointestinal lining. One single cellular layer. And that's why it's important to take care of that lining. It turns out that this area of the small intestine is enormous. It's the size of a doubles tennis court. That's the surface area of this 18 foot long small intestine. That's how it can, that's how it can achieve that, the miracle of transforming food into energy. So it starts by chewing your food, then the acid in the stomach, then the, the digestive enzymes from the pancreas, then the food's ready for inspection. At that one cell thick lining, there's a, there's a film, there's a biofilm of bacteria that live over that and mucus that protects it. If everything goes well, all of the enzymes, you've chewed well, all of the acid works, and you break down the food to individual molecules, like you break down the starches to sugar, the, the fat to small little fat cells, the, the proteins to amino acids. They can be presented to that layer, that, that cellular layer, and they can be absorbed through. Okay, and then it gets right into the bloodstream and everybody's happy. And really, that's the way it's supposed to go. If you're exposed to antibiotics and bad foods and bad drinks and germs and stress, you can break down that mucus layer. You can break down that one cell thick gastrointestinal lining and bigger chunks of food molecules get in. That causes inflammation. Those big chunks of food molecules may cause food sensitivities like sensitivity to wheat and to corn and to dairy, which are very, very common. Even chunks of bacteria can slip through there. Well, that's not good to get in your bloodstream. That's called bacteremia. That's dangerous. And all of these things can happen if that gut lining breaks down and causes inflammation. And that inflammation can lead to those problems like heart disease and brain inflammation and depression. So it's called increased intestinal permeability. And we talked about some of the causes. And if you have increased intestinal permeability, you can get these larger molecules that go through and eventually they irritate the immune system. And I told you that, that really the, what's inside the gut is your, the outside world inside your body that's just traveling through that tube. Well, more than half of our immune system lines the gut to keep us safe. More than half of our white blood cells in our body line the immune system. And if they're exposed to big chunks of bacteria and big chunks of food, they're not happy. And what they cause is inflammation, and they can cause those autoimmune diseases like the rheumatoid arthritis and the Sjogren's syndrome and the thyroiditis and all of the other 80 or so autoimmune conditions that are out there. So if you had a Lamborghini, I think you have really good gas in it, wouldn't you? You don't want to put the junk in there. You don't want to put the cheap gas. You'd put the premium, right? What many Americans are eating. This is, this is, well, let's call it cheap gas. So these are processed foods. These are manufactured and processed foods with a lot of other chemicals in them, probably antibiotics in the meats, things that break down our, our, the lining of our GI tract. They make us fat because there are a lot of processed carbohydrates. And some of you that's seen me talk before know that the two biggest things that make Americans fat are soft drinks and sweet beverages, right, and breads. You want to you watch? I, I took care of a... I, I, I won't digress. Uh, um, those are the two biggest things that cause obesity in this country. So this is high-octane fuel right here. Okay, 
Notice that on the bottom of this pyramid, there's not bread. There's a bunch of colorful vegetables and green leafy vegetables and then there's meats and eggs and all of these kind of things. So the pyramid is kind of tucked on, you know, it's kind of flipped over on its head. And where you see the breads and things like that are, it's more towards the top of the pyramid. So high octane fuel is lots of vegetables because they're anti-inflammatory and beans and lentils and grains in their whole form. That doesn't mean whole grain bread. It means whole grain. It would mean like steel cut oats. It's a whole grain. Okay. Fruits of all kinds, less if you're a diabetic meats and fish and poultry and eggs, whole fat dairy. Yes. <laughs> several, several studies, including one in the last couple weeks, show that people who eat whole fat dairy are more likely to get pregnant if they want to, are much less likely to have diabetes okay, than, than low fat dairy. Okay. Much less likely to get diabetes by eating whole fat dairy. Nuts of all kinds. Nuts have great fat. That's the kind of fat you want. Olive oil. Olive oil lowers the risk of heart disease. It doesn't make your cholesterol go down at all, but it lowers heart disease. Two to four tablespoons every day we should all be having. Sweets. So you notice the pyramid's on its head now, right? The sweets, you have a few. Have some great dark chocolate or something that you like, and then add a tincture of love, and then you've got a great meal, huh? Okay, foods, foods to avoid. Sweetened and ar artificially sweetened drinks, refined grains and flours, sugar and high fructose corn syrup, trans fats. If it says partially hydrogenated oil, it means trans fat, and that's code word for it's going to cause you to be inflamed. And if the food says healthy on it, you probably want to not eat it. Yeah, so you can make high fructose syrup from a lot of things. You know, agave, which is thought to be a good sugar, is really just high fructose cactus syrup, right? Mm -hmm. It's not any good for you, any more than, you know, sugar is not something that you want to eat very often. You know, the average American eats 135 pounds of sugar a year. Wow, yeah. Thank you for asking that question. You need to read labels carefully. This is a biggie. You know, if, if when you pick up a label, like I, we looked, I looked at a, um, a breakfast bar with somebody today, and there was so many chemical names on it, there was at least 20 ingredients. I said, okay, try this bar. So I looked up another one, and it had, you know, egg whites, dates, some nuts, a few other things, five ingredients. Great. Great. You, did you have a question? Which is an unrefined flour. Uh, so... Well, they didn't go to a fancy prep school. So the, I'm, I'm sorry, the question was, what is, it, what is an unrefined flour? And I was being a little silly, and I said they didn't go to a very good school. Um, so what that really means, and I can see why that's confusing, what it really means is when you take any grain, be it corn or wheat or oats, and you grind it into a powder and then make it into something else like a bagel or a Cheerio, it's really just sugar. Because you've ground the starch into the component sugar molecules. Starch is just a long chain of sugar. So what I really meant is whole grains. So whole grain oats. Quinoa is a whole grain. And I don't mean a whole grain oat Cheerio. I mean a, a, I mean a, um, a steel cut oat that you would cook, right? And there's something called a wheat berry, which is a whole grain. You know, there, so it's in the whole, so it has all of its form to it. When you chew it up, it takes a long time to digest. When you chew up that bagel I talked about before, remember it's digesting in your mouth, giving you sugar right away. Did that answer your question? Kinda. <laughs> yeah. So in general, you, in general, you want to limit Stay your away from flour? mostly. Okay. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stay away from flour. Move away from that flour. Uh, you had a question? So, no. Did you have a question? No. What do you mean by adding food labels? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. So when you, um, when you go into the grocery store and you go down the aisle, like say Cheerios would be in, in and it says heart healthy on the package, 
it's usually not. But if you go around the produce aisle and you pick up an avocado, it's really healthy and it doesn't say anything on it. In fact, there's not even an ingredient label on that, right? <laughs> so you follow what I'm saying? So a lot of times the things that are healthy, they'll put one healthy thing in it and they can make claim it's healthy, but it's got a lot of other things in it that aren't so healthy. Question back there, yes. Say that again, please. So, you know, complicated questions, yes. The, the food, does a food need to be fermented to be absorbed in a leaky gut situation? That's a really pretty complicated question, and not everybody, it's not. Um, let, me, let me say that, you know, in our audience, there are people that know this stuff already, most of it. And there are people that are just getting to know some of these ideas about healthy eating. All of you here, we're going to try to make this lecture, this communication, this, this lecture tonight suitable f that everybody takes good things home, right? That question is pretty complicated, and I would say that if you, most people, it would not need to be fermented, and you don't, if, if you're allergic to oats, that can cause a leaky gut problem. We don't want leaky gut, but, um, so generally no, but there's certain situations that it, fermented may be better. There's also in these processed foods, like we showed that family, that that's what they ate in that week I showed you in that picture. There's a lot of processed foods. And, and in those processed foods, there's things like artificial sweeteners, clearly been shown to cause diabetes, by the way. Artificial sweeteners clearly have been shown to cause metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Monosodium glutamate, um, synthetic trans fats, artificial flavors and preservatives. When I have a child that's not behaving well and they're having trouble in school, focusing, we get them off the sweets and we get them off the preservatives, the colorings, the, the chemicals and foods that they don't need, and they do much, much, much better. There's an, you know, I said there were seven worst things. Well, there's now an eighth that just came out, and it's something called emulsifiers. And emulsifiers have these names, like polysorbate A, polysorbate 80, and carby methyl cellulose. So if you need an advanced degree in chemistry, and this is on the label to be able to read it, then probably not a food you want to eat, right? And so you're going to find that these are in many of our foods. You'll be surprised here in just a minute. And this, this emulsifier, which makes fat and water stay together, that's what emulsifiers do, they destroy the GI lining. And they're in foods like this. These foods have both fat, they have liquid and fat portions to them, and they have emulsifiers in them so they don't separate, right? So if your peanut butter doesn't separate, you probably don't want to eat it. <laughs> you know, right? The, the peanut butter that says salt and peanuts on it, it separates, right? And that's the good one. So you just emulsify it with a, some elbow grease. This is a study in, in Nature that just came out, and it showed that emulsifiers cause colitis and prediabetes. Emulsifiers cause colitis and prediabetes. I don't think we want to be adding those to our foods. And you can avoid that by getting a lot of your foods from the produce section that don't have any ingredients other than what God naturally put in them, right? So you want to eat this and not this. That, that food on the right is what that family, that middle-class American family, ate for that entire week. Okay? There's a lot of chips and sodas and sweets and pizzas. I mean, there's a few. I think I see a tomato in there and some grapes. There's a few great foods in there, but there's a lot of junk. You don't want to eat junk. Now, for anybody that, uh, this is the only X-rated part of this whole talk here. So. Um, Hang on with me here. So we want to avoid, in other words, carbonated sweet drinks, refined sugars, artificial sweeteners, processed foods. Avoid the. <laughs> A little about how much to eat and when. Your body is designed to get up with the sun and go to bed with the dark. It's designed to eat most of the food early in the day. The, the most blood flow and digestive power that we have is at noon. That's why in most cultures, they have their biggest meal at noon. Okay? One of the ways to decrease reflux is not eat your biggest meal at 7 p.m. You'll digest your food better. You will eat, you'll eat less. You'll feel better. Have your biggest meal 
in midday uh, if you can okay you don't have to eat breakfast it says here eat breakfast like a king that'd be great but I notice in my practice that a lot of my adults don't eat much for breakfast that's not bad it's about eating a good meal in the middle of the day and not eating too much for dinner that may be enough for you if if it's your six-year-old or your eight-year-old or your ten-year-old you want them to have a great breakfast with some protein and some fat and some nutritious food so they can really pay attention in school for adults they don't need it so much some of us may but but don't feel like you have to eat breakfast to be to be doing well okay at the integrative medicine clinic we do some advanced functional medicine tests and these days the term integrative and functional medicine are synonymous and we do tests like advanced nutritional tests and I'll show you a copy of that in a minute advanced stool testing because we want to know do you really digest that food that you have in your gut food sensitivity testing that can be important and hormone this is the nutritional test it looks at 40 or so of the major nutrients vitamins minerals fatty acids amino acids so we can find out what th what you really need do you need any supplements is your body really absorbing very important test this is a stool test. This tells us, are you breaking down your food? Are in, you, you know, it makes, we can examine the stool under the microscope and we can see if there's, there's food particles that are just not digested. We can get that information. We can see if there's fat particles that shouldn't be there because we should absorb those kind of things. We can see if there's inflammation. We can see if there's parasites. We can see if you make enough enzymes in your pancreas because we can find those in your stool. If there's low enzymes in your stool, it means your pancreas isn't doing its job anymore. We can learn about stomach acid. So it does seem funny to think that you might have to go fishing for poop for a test like this, but it can be very important, very important for people that are sick. Yes, ma'am. Is there some way that we can look at the stool and determine whether or not it's, I mean, I'm not saying to other microscopes, however. If you see undigested food particles, then, then you're, you're not digesting as well as you should. And, not too often not too often some people have really fast transit time through the gut you know they eat and 12 hours later you can you know what you you know you knew what you had for dinner um that may be a little bit different but generally not and if you're if you're if your poop floats um we're adults we can say poop um <laughs> if your poop floats it means there's too much fat in it so that's something to know about too and it could get you know um so, these, that's, so there is information you can get from that. This is a food sensitivity test. I'll talk about this more in just a minute. So we're, we're, we're moving on to another section. So that's kind of the foundation here. Now we're talking about when food can be an enemy, adverse food reactions. I think many of you have seen or heard of people that have severe peanut allergies. We see it more in kids these days. And they might get hives, they might get swelling, and they may have things like trouble breathing, right? These are dangerous food sensitivities, very dangerous food allergy. We're not gonna be talking about that today. We're gonna be talking about something called food sensitivity and food intolerance, which is much more common and, and kind of corrosive, but not as immediately dangerous. Do you follow me with that? So food sensitivities are something that instead of the IgE allergy that you see at the top, they're more of an IgG phenomena. That's a special protein in the blood. And it's more of an intolerance. And it's about one out of, excuse me, 95% of the food reactions are these sorts of food sensitivities or intolerances. So at least 19 things like wheat and that. Sometimes we get a little bit of a hum here. I hope you can still hear me okay. Forgive us for that. So, so symptoms of food sensitivities are really broad. So look at all of these, from irritable bowel syndrome to bloating to palpitations from food sensitivities to eczema on your skin to cough to hoarseness to soreness in your joints. That can be related to food sensitivities. So food sensitivities cause chronic inflammation, and they can show up in a lot of these are the most common food sensitivities. Wheat, dairy, eggs, sugar, and processed foods. Okay? And by far, the most important is wheat. By far, 
the most important is wheat. In fact, I'm going to talk about gluten in, in, in a minute, more specifically, that's in wheat and barley and rye uh, and celiac. So what is one of the best ways to know if you have a food intolerance? The best way, one of the best ways is the elimination diet. Say you have this feeling that, you know, every time you have corn chips, you're just bloated or you feel achy the next day or you have fatigue. Give those corn chips up for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. Give corn up and see if you don't feel better. Okay? Many people will if that's the case. And then what you do is then you, re, you, t you, you have some more chips and salsa a few weeks later and you see how you feel. And that really seals the deal. If you feel better by stopping it and you feel worse again when you have that corn chip or as somebody told me earlier tonight, if when they had that pizza they felt really bad, that, that really tells you something. You know, your, our bodies talk to us, don't they? They, they? they give us information about what's good for us, right? So this is a food sensitivity test, and it looks at many different foods. And up on the left, there's dairy, and this person had some dairy sensitivity. It looks at things like fruits and then the vegetables. It looks at fish. It looks at poultry and meats, and it looks at nuts and grains. And this helps guide us to tell people what they may need to eliminate, at least for a while, until we can heal that leaky gut. Leaky gut. Leaky gut is not a medical term. The medical term is increased permeability of the GI lining, but leaky gut is what many of us call it. So gluten-related disorder. So this is an iceberg, and celiac disease is only the tip of the iceberg of gluten sensitivities and gluten problems. It's the most severe. It's only the tip, though. Most of the gluten-related, and something like between 1 in 10 and 1 in about one in 10 of us in this room have a significant gluten sensitivity. So look to your right and look to your left. There's somebody near you that has it. And I'll bet you if there's many of us in, uh, in here that have that. And so gluten can be a real problem for celiac disease is a disease that presents with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and malnutrition because it destroys that small intestinal lining so you cannot absorb those important nutrients. It, uh, is precipitated by gluten, which is in barley, wheat, and rye, and you have to have a genetic susceptibility for that. And the cornerstone is a gluten-free diet. People get better. My grandmother uh, in the 19, early 1970s had a few years where she uh, continued to lose weight and lose weight and get gaunt in her face, and she was kind of irritable and cranky as she was feeling poorly. I found that out. Um, and she had diarrhea, and it took about 10 years for the doctors to be able to diagnose her celiac condition. You know, um, we didn't have as good tools back then to diagnose it. We have, we have good tools now. It still takes doctors 10 years to diagnose celiac in most people. It's a chameleon. Um, one in 100 of us have celiac, and if, if you have a family member like I do with celiac, it's one in 22. Celiac disease is a clinical chameleon. The battleground is in the gut, but it happens in any tissue. It starts with ulcers in the mouth. It can relate to female-related problems. It can cause other intestinal problems, joint and muscle pain, all sorts of nutrient and vitamin deficiencies. Behavioral concerns from depression to schizophrenia can be related to Skin-related, there are many different rashes that occur, and there's all sorts of other things. It's a chameleon, and that's why it's so hard to diagnose. Because we used to think that if you had celiac, you had to have diarrhea, bloating, and abdominal pain. Most of the people I see with celiac don't. They come in with other symptoms. I have a very low threshold to test for that, very low. Yes? Um, if you were to do that food testing, can you tell if you have celiac? We're, uh, yes. And, let me show you some other the, of the other specific tests. You know, one of the really good parts of when people ask, uh, ask questions um, is that I get to take a, <laughs> a drink of water, so thank, thank you. She asked if we're going to talk more about the celiac blood testing, and we will. Now, in the last 50 years, celiac diseases went up th how many fold? Every, every 15 years since 1950, it's doubled. And how do we know that? Because we have military blood that we save from the 1950s and 60s, and we have blood from the Mayo Clinic in patients from their county called Olmstead County, where we know how many people in that county ha had celiac in the 1950s. And now, 
many, many more people. It was one in 500 back then, it's one in 100 now. Why is that? Why is there so much more celiac now than there was in the 1950s? Well, you know, our wheat's different. You know, it used to be amber fields this high. Now they're tiny little guys. That's a different wheat with a lot more gluten. There's um, more GI berry dysfunction because we're taking more medications and Advil and uh, things like that. And there's a change in the microbiome. Our bacteria is changing because of antibiotics. And there's also emulsifiers in our food, right? There's something going on with our guts in regard to celiac. Now is gluten, this is the gluten molecule. Gluten is, a, is an unusual molecule because it's stretchy. And when it's stretchy, it's hard for us to digest. It's stretchy and it makes great bread, right? So it rises and it can stretch. That's the gluten molecule. That's what makes bread. Well, gluten cannot be digested fully by any human on the planet. And if you break it in the wrong chunks, like the blue chunks in the middle, that causes leaky gut syndrome. Nobody can fully digest the gluten molecule. Nobody can. And if, you just, if you're one of those persons that digests it in a poor way and you break it into chunks like those blue chunks in the middle, those blue chunks go to the gut lining, break it down, open it up, and cause leaky gut syndrome, which opens the door to autoimmune disease, inflammation, and a lot of other chronic problems. So how do we test, and this goes to the question that you asked, how do we test for celiac? Blood testing is really common. And the standard test is something called the IgA-TTG, and your doctor knows about that. That's one of the best tests. There's another advanced test, and I'll show you that in a minute, that's called the Cyrex lab, very advanced. Endoscopy, one of the ways we can do it is we can biopsy the small intestine, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And we can do genetic testing. I did genetic testing on myself, because uh, I knew about my grandmother, and mine was positive. So, you can also do the elimination diet. If you feel like wheat may be a problem, get off it for 30 days or 60 days and see how you feel. The best tests are, the, are that IgA, TTG, the endoscopy with biopsy, and the elimination diet. But let me just say this. You know, I told you that that gut lining was, that gut, the small gut, the small bowel, the small intestine is 18 feet long. They'll go down there and they'll biopsy six or eight little spots. And they can come out of there and say, you know, we don't find celiac there. Well, there was, th that spot is about the size, you know, maybe of a pin, uh, of the head of a pin. Remember the size of the small intestine? It was the size of a doubles tennis court. They could miss celiac, couldn't they? And they do. Not because they want to, it's because there's limits in the biopsy. Biopsy is a great test when celiac is bad like it was in my grandmother, when she was malnourished and gaunt and sick, sick, sick. But when you're not so sick, it's not such a good test. This is the advanced Cyrex labs where it looks at, oh gosh, there must be 25 different antigens in the blood, antibodies in the blood that we can test for. So I've t done this test on several people who had a negative biopsy and had a um, negative standard blood test and this was positive and it made a difference in their lives. Insurance doesn't pay for this, unfortunately, not yet anyway. So this is the endoscopy. Endoscopy is when we look, for those of you that, some of you probably knew what I was talking about. You look down, you put this, you snake this small tube down and you can actually take pictures and look in the small intestine. And I talked to you about how the small intestine had villi, right? Had a great surface area. If you have celiac, you lose that. So on the left is the normal, and on the right is where all of those villi are blunted and gone. And that means that most of the gastrointestinal tract lining that you absorb your food with is now gone. No wonder that you might have malnutrition, huh? More common than celiac is the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And there's lots of different things about this. So in these people, they will have negative blood testing. They'll have negative biopsies, but they'll have a lot of symptoms. And the doctor will say, you know, let's just try an elimination period off wheat and they get better. So they may have went to one doctor and the doctor said, you know, I don't think it's wheat because all of your blood tests are normal, right? And some doctors might even be so bold to say, you don't have a wheat allergy or a gluten problem. But it turns out that one in 10 of us does. 
right? So um, any doctor that thinks they're right all the time is, is not right all the time. And they're probably, they may not be right for you. Um, you know, you want doctors to know their science, know their medicine, to be confident about what they're doing with you. But they're not always right, because science changes. Tests get better, right? OK, now we're going to move towards some other conditions that I promised we'd talk about, like GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So one in five Americans have this, and there are 100 million prescriptions a year for the purple pill. Wow, that's a lot of dough. That's a lot of purple. This was written by uh, the, um, the guidelines written by a previous um, director of the American College of Gastroenterologists. And this is what he said. If we took 100 people with reflux and got them to, to follow the lifestyle recommendations, 90% of them wouldn't need any medication, right? 90% of people with reflux on the purple pill would not need any medication. And this is the former leader of the Gastroenterology Association. So the purple pill, I'm sure that some of you are on it. I've taken it before in my life. I've certainly prescribed it. Um, it is a very powerful medication. If you have a bleeding ulcer, you want to be on this medication lickety split, right? But it has potentially dangerous side effects. Strong medications can have strong side effects. Let's just talk about some of those. Iron deficiency anemia, pneumonia. Increased heart disease, increased stroke, magnesium deficiency, increased infectious diarrhea, osteoporosis. This is not a medication that should be sold over the counter in every store in the country, basically. It's not a medication your doctor should put you on unless there's a really good reason for it, right? and certainly shouldn't keep you on it for very long unless there's a really good reason. I don't want anybody to go home and stop their medications based on this, but it's a good question to ask your doctors about. So how do you treat the symptoms of gastroenteritis and actually really the causes? One of the biggies is to stop eating after dinner. Foraging after dinner is really, it's one of the things that, you know, if there's a third thing, I talked about three things that, that lead to obesity, sugar sweetened beverages, breads and refined grains. Um, and it's eating after dinner, folks. We're not designed to digest then, and we eat a bunch of, of that CR, you know, we eat a bunch of junk, right, after dinner. OK, so don't eat three hours before bed. Chew your food well. Remove processed foods. Get the junk out, and you, you will. I can tell you in my practice, the beauty of practice is we get to see the outcomes. And I get to see people come back to me and say, boy, my reflux is better. Well, how'd you do that? I got off the processed foods, doctor. I got off the, the, the breads, the bagels, the cereals, the cakes, the cookies, the things like that. Reflux gets better. And you stop eating after dinner, and it, and it really gets better. Okay? You remove any foods you're sensitive to, and we can do testing on that, or we can do the elimination diet. You might have to use digestive enzymes if we decide your enzymes are low. DGL is something called deglycerinized licorice. Deglycerinized licorice. So I'll just leave it at that. We'll leave it at DGL. Um, so uh, it, it helps coat the lining of the gut, of the esophagus and stomach. It's very good. I'll show you more on that in a minute. And you can get that at local health food stores. Interestingly, chewing gum. Some people can tolerate some gum. And I, you know, a, um, a small amount of gum, you don't need, you know, a a big piece, but a small piece would be great, and chew that for an hour or so. And what happens is, is you facilitate movement of the upper gastrointestinal tract. You increase the amount of saliva, and saliva is a natural antacid, isn't it? Yes. This is a product that we have in our clinic that I really like. It's called Reflux Relief, and it has a little calcium bicarbonate. You know that can be helpful. It has a little aloe leaf in it. This is a this is a. a um, a chewable tablet we have. It has something called, well, it has the licorice I talked about in it, and it has something called marshmallow, not mellow, but marshmallow. And marshmallow is a plant that has a lot of, that has a natural mucousy substance in it that helps coat the upper gut. So we really like it. And this was a study, and shockingly, you know, if any of you have had reflux, your doctor probably told you to get away from those fatty foods, right? No fatty foods. This is a study at Duke. 
And what they did is they took people off processed foods and grains, and they gave them a, get this, a high fat diet. In five days, their reflux went away, five days. How did they do that? A high fat diet. What would be a good high-fat diet? Well, you'd probably have some meat, you'd have some olive oil, you'd have some avocado, you'd have some, um, you might have some cheese if you're not dairy, dairy allergic, you might have some nuts, you'd have extra olive oil, okay? I said olive oil twice, That's, I wanted to because it's really good. Um, <laughs> so somebody in this room has IBS. And they know that this poor frog is suffering because of pain and bloating, right? And that's what IBS is about, irritable bowel syndrome. And what was interesting is a lot of doctors thought this was all in your head. You know, the woman, which is more common in women than men, although men get it too, that the woman was just too stressed, right? Just in their head. This is, the di this is an official character, well, uh, description of it. It is a common intestinal condition characterized by pain, cramping, diarrhea, constipation, or both, and bloating and gassiness. And if to get the diagnosis, you have to have it three days per month for at least three months over a six-month period. That's how you get the diagnosis of IBS. Very common. In fact, 15% of our population has IBS. Pretty common. Pretty common. So it, it's a problem with motility. Sometimes, you know, there's too slow motility, so you have constipation, or too fast motility, so you have diarrhea. There can be a brain-gut connection. So it's true that when a person's stressed, you're not going to digest as well and not have the motility and not have the digestive enzymes and the acid. Remember that, that nerve I talked about, the vagus nerve that comes from the brain? Yes, there's a connection between the brain and the gut. That doesn't mean that it's just stress that causes it, though. Hypersensitivity, we think that some people with IBS don't tolerate distension of the gut very well. You know, some people can have growling in their stomach and they think it's kind of funny, it doesn't hurt them. Other people get growling and it kind of hurts them. You know, you know people like that. They feel it, it makes them feel uncomfortable. So there's a different sensitivity of some people versus other people in, their, in regards to their, the sensations from their gut. Food sensitivities like gluten and wheat can be a big problem with IBS. Sugars like fructose that come from um, fruits and lactose that come from milk can be a big problem in, in IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And interestingly, infection is now known to be one of the leading causes of irritable bowel syndrome. So this is an example where in the 1980s, if you were to go to the doctor, or the 1990s, or maybe even 2010, that you go to the doctor with irritable bowel syndrome and they say, you know, you're going to have to watch what you eat, you're going to have some of the pain, let me give you some things to slow down cramping, and you really got to work on your stress. And now we know, because of recent research, that although that doctor was confident about that and generally right, that there's more to it, that there's infection as a big cause. And I'll bet you some of you have seen these commercials recently for Zyfaxin, which is a medication you're seeing on the nightly news now for the treatment of IBS. How do we treat it? Well, we remove the offending foods. And I tell you, half the people that come to me with irritable bowel syndrome, I take them off just processed foods package and manufactured foods and get them eating real foods, real meat, real vegetables, real oils, real nuts, real eggs, they get better, half of them. So if you have that, that's the first thing you want to do. To treat motility, we use things like fiber, lots and lots of fiber, you know, nuts and seeds and, and all sorts of vegetables have fiber in it, and then magnesium. And again, I'm going to just mention magnesium. I like magnesium citrate. It's available in capsule form, and I want you to buy the little green bottle of it because that'll make you have diarrhea for sure. But you use a couple of capsules uh, of this. Um, um, you know, every night, you can, and you can use even more than that. You can talk to your doctor about it, and this can make a big difference for you. Interesting that fiber decreases constipation, and it also decreases diarrhea because it helps the loose, watery stools become more formed and more controllable for people. Probiotics, we'll talk more about those in a minute. And, and we got to reduce those processed foods. And treating infections. And I mentioned that now we know that irritable bowel syndrome has infection as a major cause. Antibiotics like that Zyfaxin that I mentioned. And in the integrative clinic, we use other powerful antibiotics. They're called garlic and oregano and berberine, which comes from some plants as well. 
And these are very powerful antibiotics, believe it or not. We use them all the time and have great success with them. And then we repopulate the gut with great bacteria. And some, some uh, doctors and scientists with a sense of humor, they call it repopulate. So, okay. I know it's like, and my humor isn't that good, so forgive me. Um, and then we do things to relax the gut, because remember, the gut, the gut can get distended. And there are wonderful herbs. Peppermint is a wonderful herb that decreases the contractility of the gut, and it, it makes you more tolerant to some of this. And you can get peppermint pills, believe it or not. And I'm not talking about the red peppermint things. I'm talking about a, a little capsule of peppermint. There's a wonderful, yeah, there's a wonderful herb, uh, chamomile. Uh, Chamomile is a wonderful herb that relaxes the gut. Love it. And then meditation can really help relax the gut too. So if you have irritable bowel syndrome, you have a family member with it, there's lots of things we can do to help you. Probiotics, for example. There's a, um, a term in medicine called the number needed to treat. How many people do I need to give a probiotic to make their, their irritable bowel syndrome better? Four people. So just four people need to take one, and they're gonna, at least one of those people are going to get better. Most medications like statin drugs, you have to take, you know, you have to treat 50 people to get one person better with a statin drug. Okay. So this is really good. Um, and you want to use doses to 10 to 40 billion. So there's a lot of bacteria in those capsules. And there's a couple of bacteria you'll, pr that you'd like to use. This bifidobacter infantis and this lactobacillus. Those are a combination that really help syndrome. And this is a study on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This is what I talked about in 2011, where they came out and said, you know, people that have irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea have infections, and we can treat those. If they have irritable bowel syndrome with gas after they eat and bloating, that means they have bacteria in their small intestine where they don't belong, instead of in their large intestine where they do belong. And you ferment the food. So uh, this is, again, on the herbal antibiotics that we use, garlic, oregano, and so what happens in irritable, bowel, in irritable bowel syndrome is that when you get bacteria where you don't want them to be and you get food that's not fully digested and the food and the bacteria mix, it starts to produce gas and it's a fermentation process that makes things distend and more fluid gets in there. So there's more water, there's more gas, there's more distension and there's more pain. That's irritable bowel syndrome. And there's a, f a group of foods called F FODMAPs, and they're highly fermentable foods that cause a lot of gas and fluid and distension. So you want to know about FODMAPs if you have irritable bowel syndrome, and you wanna, you're not allergic to FODMAPs, but you just want And this is what FODMAP stands for. Fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So there are things like broccoli and breads and beans and dairy with the lactose and fructose from certain fruits, okay? And certain alcohols, like xylitol, for example, that might be in gum, you know, that's a sugar alcohol. So you lower your FODMAPs and you get less gas and bloating, and that can really help people with irritable bowel syndrome. And for those of you that are interested in this, there's, there's a wonderful YouTube video by this man, Dr. Gibson, and this is, the, uh, this is the link for it, okay? Wonderful video, about an hour long, really goes into great detail about irritable bowel syndrome and, and how to decrease it. Yes? Sorry, I have another question. So I saw um, one you have a picture of yogurt, and I think you were talking about emulsifiers, maybe? Like with the peanut butter? Yeah, right. Um, so yogurt's a great food, and I'm glad you asked that question because I didn't. I must not have explained things very, very well there. So um, yogurt's got great protein in it, and for people that are not allergic to dairy, it's uh, terrific. I love it for kids. I like the probiotics in it. Fermented foods are excellent. The problem with the yogurt I showed you there, it was a highly processed yogurt. Turn it around, and you're going to see that it has emulsifiers in it. You're going to see it's got a bunch of other chemicals in it. If you get like another brand. Um, well, you know, you can, you know, go, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the dairy section, and I want you to pick up a couple yogurts, and pick one up that says yogurt and fruit, two or three ingredients, you know, okay, without the other junk. Same thing with the peanut butter. So you can go to the peanut butter aisle, and you can pick up 
the one with the emulsifiers that's smooth and creamy, maybe chunky. Or you can pick up the one that says peanuts and salt that you're going to have to mix up. Okay. Any aisle in the, ref in, in, the, in the grocery store, if you go to, um, if you're looking for a marinara sauce or a ketchup or, you know, a, a variety of different things like yogurt, et cetera, you can find one that's really healthy for you by reading those labels. So read the labels. It can really, really help. And once you've read them a couple of times, you know, that first time you go to the grocery store and do that, it's going to take you a little longer. But the next time, you know right, right which one to pick, don't you? Yes? Is it generally true then that the fewer ingredients, the better it's going to be for you? Absolutely. It is generally true that if it's got a few ingredients, that's a good thing to go by. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. All right. Yes? Do you, do you think of frozen vegetables as processed food? Just plain frozen vegetables like peas, carrots, greens? They, that, that's a good question, too. So are frozen vegetables a good food to eat? And I'd say yes. You know, that package probably says, you know, broccoli on it or mixed vegetable on it. That's just fine. Now, if you can get, you know, broccoli that's, you know, just out of your garden, you know, here in a few weeks, that's going to be a better food. It's going to be more alive, better health. But a frozen vegetable is a great, you know, we, we eat frozen all the time. I love my frozen berries all winter long. Those are great foods for us. And they don't have, a, they, don't, they don't need to be, they don't need preservatives. They don't need other things for colorings. They don't need emulsifiers. So yes, frozen is just fine. And then I, you know, then I'd put a canned vegetable maybe third on the list, right? In regards to healthy for us. Okay, <laughs> the topic we've all been waiting for, and this kind of signifies we're getting towards the end. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Elimination. It's all about fiber. And I'll tell you some of the greatest fibers around you guys are the seeds, the chia seeds, the flax seeds, the pumpkin seeds. Eat your seeds. They're full of great fat, great fiber. They're really good for us. Fiber, fiber, fiber. Water. If you get dehydrated, your bowels are going to get dehydrated too. And it's hard to pass concrete when it gets that, you know, hard. Probiotics help peristalsis and help you move your bowels better. They absolutely do. We love probiotics. Magnesium, and this is where I said two to eight capsules. Some people have stubborn constipation. You need to move your bowels daily. Two to eight capsules a night. If you have severe renal disease, you're on dialysis, you cannot take magnesium. If you have any questions, you can always talk to your doctor about it. Interestingly, high dose vitamin C, the powdered vitamin C, a typical vitamin C capsule may be like 250 or 500 milligrams. If you really have stubborn constipation, you can take 5 to 10 grams of vitamin C. I'm going to talk about it. I told you at the end, we talk about the gut bacteria. Any, any questions about constipation? No, let me just say that that is one of the biggest problems I see in my clinic. Um, you know, lots of people have trouble moving their bowels, particularly as we get older. Uh, fluids and fiber and trying to move daily and using your magnesium. I've made a lot of friends with magnesium. <laughs> I, I, you know, that's one of the pills I do push. You know, it's, it just really, really helps, folks. Okay. So a probiotic and a prebiotic, you've heard these terms, a probiotic is the live bacteria that makes us healthier in our gut. A prebiotic is the fiber that you get from those pumpkin seeds and you get from the broccoli that travels through the small intestine, we can't digest it, goes down to the large intestine and feeds those bacteria that give us life and health. You need fiber for those good bacteria. That fiber, prebiotics, the prebiotics help grow those healthy bacteria. They selectively grow the healthy bacteria like the lactobacillus and the bifidobacter that decrease IBS. How's that? And a symbiotic, and I'll show you one in a minute, is, one, is a product that has both a probiotic and a prebiotic. So I'll tell you one of my favorite symbiotics. It's sauerkraut, right? Fiber from the cabbage, fermented sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is one of my favorite symbiotics. I had some for dinner tonight, uh, as a matter of fact, and it was Bubby's. You know Bubby's sauerkraut? Yeah. 
Good. I, it's one of the best. And it's refrigerated, so it's live bacteria in there. Live bacteria. Bubby sauerkraut available at the local grocery stores. Bubbies, Bubbies, that's the name of it, B-U-B-B-I-E-S. It's an unrefined sauerkraut, Bubbies. <laughs> okay, um, so the gut is the inner tube of life. I'm going to just skip through this. because. Um, so there's a paradigm shift in medicine where we wanted to just, you know, shoot shoot bacteria dead, we wanted to fight them, kill them. You know, that's what I was taught in medical school in the 80s. But now we want to grow them. We want to make them, we want to grow the good guys. Because a good microflora, which means the bacteria in our gut, in fact, this is a study in Nature, one of the most premier scientific journals, and they said that if you have great bacteria, you have less heart disease, less cancer, Less p other pathogens in your gut, less autoimmune disease, better gut motility, and less heart disease. Just amazing. How do we cultivate a healthy gut flora? Well, hopefully we were born vaginally because we get lactobacillus from our mother's vagina as we're born. And then when we breastfeed as a baby, as an infant, we get bifidobacter. Lactobacillus, great. Bifidobacter, great. We get it from her breast. The mother provides this to us. And we also get it in our diet. We get it in our diet when we eat fermented foods and we eat fiber, okay? And when we eat fresh vegetables, by the way, you go to the, you pick up some kale or some chard or some broccoli, there's bacteria on those, on those vegetables. And you can rinse them a bit, you're gonna maybe get the bacteria down a little bit, but it's got some microscopic dirt on there. That's good. And gardening is great for us in regards to the dirt. And I'll show you about how dirt makes us healthier. Oh, this last one is that in children with atopy, that's allergies and asthma, the dirtier they are, the less asthma and allergies they get. The more, it, the more dirty older brothers and sisters they have bringing in the infections and the crud and the pets and stuff like that, the less allergy and asthma those kids get. The kids that live on a farm get less allergy and asthma. How's that? Fermented foods are just great. We've talked about how fermented foods, having some daily is a great idea. Fermented dairy, if you can tolerate dairy. I really like fermented vegetables. I love kimchi. I love sauerkraut. Fermented soy, fermented fish and meats. Try to eat fermented foods daily. Many traditional cultures eat fermented foods. How do we disrupt? If we don't eat fiber, if we have food additives, we disrupt our microbiome. If we eat too many foods that we're intolerant to, if we take too many antibiotics or eat antibiotic-laden food, stress can change it. The purple pill can also change our microbiome. And then I talked about how the bacterial overgrowth, if you have the wrong bacteria, it can run out the good guys. This is a study about the GI microbiome and obesity. And yes. I think that um, you can eat a lot, honestly, but for most people, if you had a couple of tablespoons of bubby sauerkraut or some kimchi or a good quality yogurt, maybe a little bit more of that, that would be a good amount for your gut. Yes. And then, you know, Bobby also sells the cells into the bread and butter. So can you explain to me the bread and butter I don't know about Bubby's bread and butter. You know, you can have fermented butter. Uh, there's some wonderful fermented butter. It's a she's about, and it's a bread and butter pickle. Oh. Oh. Oh, I got you. I don't know enough about that product. I know that Bubby's is a really good company, and I'm not here to promote them, but sure. they, they have um, great products. You know, it's, if it's got extra sugar in it, I'm not going to be as much of a fan of it. Right. Now, um, th this is an extraordinary story, I'm going to tell you. So those two mice, they're identical twins. Right? They eat exactly the same diet. Not exactly the same food, because they're given, you know, they're in a cage, they're given exactly the same amount. 
the one on the left was given a transplant of, of poop from a human twin who was obese. Now, the other mouse was given a transplant of feces. It's called a, it's called a fecal microbiome transplant, an FMT. We're doing it now in medicine, folks, for certain conditions. He was given, the thin mouse was given the poop, the feces from a, a twin, the other twin that was thin. So the only difference is the bacteria in the gut. And the bacteria changed the processing of that, that food, that changed the metabolism in that animal. Because the bacteria can talk to us through our, through our blood. You know, it, th these bacteria, they secrete byproducts, and those byproducts get into our bloodstream. They go to our brain. They can make us hungry. They can make us be irritable. They, they're, they're, their physiological byproducts can affect us. You realize there are, there are many, 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 many more bacteria in our guts than there are cells in our body. Probably 10 to 1. Some people think we're just a vessel carrying those bacteria around, and they're really controlling most of the things. So uh, just, just interesting about this. And so, um, oh, um, so really, really interesting about how powerful the microbiome is. And I told you there's only one X-rated thing. There's two. Um, so it asks scientists asking, what is in that stuff? OK. Um, this, is, this is association of uh, antibiotics given to children. And the children that got antibiotics were more likely to be obese. So when we're playing with the microbiome, it has some effects. So how do we restore the microbiome? You take probiotics, you eat a lot of vegetable fibers. Um, for some people that are really sick, like somebody with a Clostridium difficile colitis, have you ever heard of C. diff colitis? It's dangerous. It comes from too many antibiotics and hospitalizations at times. We can give them feces from a healthy human being and their disease goes away like that. Where they're this close to death, and they can get better that quick, and within hours, hours. It's not something that's done very often, but it can be done. And then we need to, sometimes we need to give antibiotics, actually, to get rid of them. This is the, the story about uh, probiotics and allergies and asthma. I won't go through that. I'll just tell you that it really works. And then this is about children in daycare. Children that get probiotics, healthy bacteria, on a daily basis that are in daycare, they get 40% less diarrheal illness. They get a lot less respiratory illness because it improves their immune system. And it benefits not only the child, but the family, right? Because the mom can go to work. Dad can go to work. So probiotics can be for children. Um, the type of pro probiotics, and again, we, uh, this is going a little longer than I, so thanks for being tolerant here. Lactobacillus and Bifidobacter are the really good guys. We've talked about those a couple of times. So when you look for a probiotic, you're going to want to look for a probiotic with those type of bacteria. There's a yeast we really like. It's called Saccharomar Saccharomyces boulardii. That's a probiotic yeast that's very healthy. Doses can be from 500 million to 500 billion, and I'll show you an example in a minute. It's best taken with food. When we eat food, actually, the pH in our stomach goes up, so the bacteria can live through that. Best taken a couple of hours away from an antibiotic if you're going to be on an antibiotic. And most people that I start on an antibiotic for a serious illness, I also put them on a probiotic at the same time. I want them to have the good bacteria if I'm going to be um, giving them a, an antibiotic. And most these days, do refrigerated. These are over-the-counter ones that are available for everybody. <clears throat> this is a line. Uh, it's Bifidobacter infatus. This is really good for, for irritable bowel syndrome. This is Culturel. This is the one that was really good to decrease asthma and allergies in babies. So if the mom took the probiotic and then the baby took it after birth, the children didn't get nearly as much asthma or allergies and they used Culturel. Floristore is that Saccharomyces yeast, that important yeast. All of these, again, are available over the counter. And this VSL-3 is 450 billion, and we use it for very serious problems like Crohn's disease. All available. 
And these are some professional brands that we use in the clinic. The one on the left has the back lactobacillus, it has the bifidobacter and the yeast in it. And this one on the right is actually soil-based bacteria because we're finding that the soil is so important. Okay, the four pillars of GI health, digest, relax and chew, take care of your gut line, gut integrity is really important. Take care of your bacteria. They are our gut buddies and they help us stay healthy and eliminate. Try to move your bowels daily. I'm going to just mention that we're going to continue this series as long as Carpet and Community Health would like us to do so next fall um, on women health and hormones, uh, on men, men's health and hormones. That'll be two different lectures. And then one on detoxification towards the winter that I think you might be in. I want to let you know about, um, at our clinic, we have a nutrition educator. Her name is Joni Hall. We really leverage the power of nutrition in our clinic, and you can come see, come see Joni. If you're not a member of the clinic and you'd like to see her, we give, we'll give, this is, this is in your slides, uh, in your booklet there, and you can use that as a coupon for half, well, it's $30 instead of $50 for an hour. So you can come see Joni. And last, um, we have an, at, at the integrated <laughs> clinic, we have, we have a small health food store, actually, of some of the best kind of natural foods and bars and olive oil and some great salmon that's actually canned salmon. Um, lots of different things, some great supplements, some, some natural skincare products, some natural products to uh, clean your home with, so several different things. If you bring this with you, you can get a 10% discount.